Hello, everybody! Welcome to A Survivor's Guide to Hell, the podcast. I'm PJ Aubrey, here to walk you through this pessimist-friendly guide to finding the silver lining. Each week, we pick an unpleasant topic and share some stories and information that will hopefully help you laugh, help you find a bright side, or even change your perspective on something. Thank you so much for listening. Today, our unpleasant topic is... The Teenage Years Part 2 Last week, we decided that the teenage years are a tricky topic to handle, considering how much there is to love and hate about being a teen. Teenagers definitely have the lion's share of some of life's greatest blessings, but those years don't come without their balls and chains. In our last episode, we served you a lifetime sandwich by interviewing some skate park teenagers then asking the same questions to established adults. This week, we'll go even further in depth with our teenage selves. I'll finally sit down with my own teenage stepdaughter and try to get to the bones of what makes her tick. Afterwards, we'll review the mysterious Mother's Day letters written by the teens of a nameless family. Ready? Let's get started. Act 1. Understanding the Teenager Upstairs Her name is Jordan. She's my stepdaughter, though I prefer to simply call her daughter. Teenage Dum had recently hit her with full force, leaving my husband and I staggering with questions. How can we motivate our kids to make healthy choices that they don't like? How can we inspire our kids to get a job done right, even if it's unpleasant? How do we help our kids find quality friends and ditch the ones that bring nothing but drama and bad influences? How do we get our kids out of their own head so they can experience the real world once in a while? We had a theory or two for each question. Because Jordan was the oldest, she was the default guinea pig. And most of our ideas seemed only to ricochet after we'd aimed them at her. Jordan is not a trouble kid. At least, not most of the time. But like most parents for their own children, Jerry and I see a wealth of potential inside of Jordan that we crave to help her tap into. As I created part one of this episode, she was popping up everywhere in my memory, and it became clear that there was one more teenager I needed to talk to, the one that lived right upstairs. One morning, while the toddlers were still in bed, I invited her into my office for an interview. My first question is, what is your greatest fear for the next 10 years? Mm, uh... Probably just letting people down. Are there specific people, or is it just people in general? The people that I care about, and the people that I know care about me, and the people that are helping me get where they want me to be. But, like, when somebody is trying to help me do something, like, feel better, or something like that, and it doesn't work, like, things like that make me really upset. I mean, but that was only an example. If somebody's trying to help me get somewhere or something like that as well, like, you know, just helping me with pretty much anything. If I can't, like, yeah, follow through, then I get really disappointed. <laughs> it sounds like that's your greatest fear for the present and the future. Mm -hmm. You mentioned some present things. What are some future things you're worried about letting people down over? Getting into college. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well... Do you know that me and dad are okay if you don't go to college? No. Okay. On a scale of 1 to 10, how comforting is that? Um, probably like... Maybe. That's good. So you feel very comforted knowing that we were not expecting you to go to college. Unless you pick a career that requires you to go to college. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Alright, here's my next question. What about the next 10 years are you the most hopeful for? Getting into college. I'd rather get into um, a good college with a good scholarship, but I don't get very good grades. You don't get very bad grades. I get average grades. And that's not really I good would say slightly above average at least, but I actually think your grades are good. Okay. They're still not getting enough for a scholarship, though. <laughs> Maybe not. So your greatest hope is to get into college. 
of course, preferably a great college with a great scholarship. Yeah, and it's not like it has to be like the best college, just I want to get into a, a pretty good college so that if I wanted to, I could study abroad in China and like then I could go to a nice vet college after that. Anything else that you want to say about your hopes for the next 10 years? Just to be stable and not be in a lot of debt. I want to... And you'll what about debt? Not And not be in a lot of debt. Okay. I don't want to be in debt. And I want a dog. Your own dog of your choice. So what do you mean by stable? Like, have enough money to be where I need to be and be paying off my bills every month and like... Okay, so financially secure. Uh, yeah, financially se secure, like have a, have a place to stay, you know, because I'm not going to be living here all my life. And then in the next 10 years, I might be going to a different college where I have to stay in the dorm or something like that. Right. And you want to know that you can afford that and not be afraid of falling short financially. Yeah. <clears throat> what is most important to you right now, this phase of your life, uh, making money. <laughs> making money. <laughs> making money. Why is making money important? So that I can get the things that I want. That sounds... Uh, I don't know how to explain it. It sounds like I'm just wanting like to buy clothes and like stuff like that, but I'm talking about like being able to like save up if I want and get the pen tablet that I want and like just starting to save up money so that I can do the things that I want. Would it like be I, like I used to be able to take my friends out for ice cream mm -hmm. um, during the summer? I want to be able to do that again. Would it be accurate to say that making money isn't really what's most important to you? It's just the freedom that money gives you is most important to you? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's both, but yeah, mostly the freedom. Freedom is awesome. But it's also nice to be able to go window shopping. Well, here's, here's another question. Do you think what's most important to you now lines up with your biggest hopes and fears for the future? Do you think it prepares you for your hopes and your fears? Learning how to save up for my money, yes. Okay. I think that helps. I agree. I don't think anything else does. <laughs> does that bother you? What's most important to you now is maybe not pointing you in a direction that's gonna help what's most important to you in the future? Frankly, I don't think about it enough for it to bother me. Like, I don't think about like the things that I do now enough for, me, for it to bother me, but like, I see how not thinking about it is a bad thing. Okay. But, um, I think that there are some other things that I that I am thinking about that'll help me, like, learning Chinese is yeah. getting me somewhere. Yes. Like, taking a high school class, making sure I'm ahead in my classes. Mm-hmm. I try. <laughs> um, yeah, just school. School stuff is, is the other thing that's very important. Yes, saving up my money in my school. Okay. Yeah, I think that's great. What? Okay, there's, like, a lot of people right now between the ages of zero and 12, getting ready to be teenagers. Is there any advice you would give them? Save up your money while you can. While you can? What do you mean by while you can? Can you not save up your money right now? I remember when I had that big, big jar of like pennies and I had like $300 or so in it. Like pennies and dollars and, you know, whatever else. Yeah, cash. And then it was lost on the highway. It was lost on the highway? Yeah, it fell on the back of a car. <laughs> so your advice... To... Keep your money somewhere safe for okay. one. And for two, and like after that, I just stopped being able to save up my money. Like, because it would go into a bank and like I had a card... And I just swipe and be like, I'm getting ice cream until my card was declined. Like, <laughs> wow. 
That's an actually really solid life lesson, Jordan. <laughs> Save up your money and try to keep it somewhere where it's not going to fall out of a car. Okay. Anything else before I hit the stop button? I mean, you're the one asking questions, right? Yeah, but I also want you to feel free to say what's most important to you. So if I've asked the wrong questions, maybe there's something you want to say anyway. Okay. You don't have to. Well... I mean, that was all pretty good. <laughs> well, okay then. If I'm leaving with something else, the last thing I'll say is, is if any kids are watching this, they should save up their money while they're young so they get used to it. And all the parents watching this listening. should teach their, or yeah, listening to this, need to teach their kids while they're young to save up their money because it's important. It's way more important than they think. Okay. <laughs> Wise words from the mouth of teens. <laughs> Very good. I love you. I love you too. All right. I loved that talk with Jordan. It wasn't what I was expecting. I thought we might penetrate some source of angst and broodiness. I thought we might even get teary-eyed together after some form of an outburst and share a hug. But instead of the theatrics, I got to learn about how far my daughter has made it into this whole growing up thing. She didn't talk about boys, anime, or her favorite music. She talked about dependability, education, and finance. A new realization was budding inside me. Perhaps I've been overly worried about Jordan's trajectory. The tapping in to her potential is already being done, in a quiet, personal way, that Jordan captains herself. I should have known. Of course, she's still got a few puzzle pieces to slip in before she sets out on her own, and I saw some ways I could be a better mom. Ultimately, however, I felt reassured that the two of us youngins are still headed in the right direction. Act 2. The Lost Mother's Day Letters of a Nameless Family My mother stayed the night a few weeks ago. She brought her usual supplies, namely a suitcase, a purse, and some food to share. But as she moved about our home to put things in their place, a strange little container ended up on the kitchen table. It looked like a small, used peanut can with foam sheets glued around it. Someone had dabbled the blue and purple foam with green gel dots and used the same gel to write mom in sloppy, childlike letters on it. Quizzically, I picked up the can. What's this? I asked my mom. Did we make this for you one Mother's Day? Mom set her purse down and smiled. No, that was in the back of my desk at my new job. I thought it'd be fun to read what was inside. Later that night, we unloaded the contents and found no less than eight letters, each addressed to someone's mother. None of the letters even shared the mother's real name, or offered a last name. After we read them, it quickly became apparent that two or three of the letter's authors were probably teenagers, and they had learned some life lessons very early. We had reason to believe that four different kids were responsible for the letters, approximately ages 6 through 18. In many ways, they were typical Mother's Day offerings. Silly, youthful, and peppered with cliché phrases. Still, these kids sounded anything but typical. Something mysterious had happened in their lives. Something big that changed the way they saw their mother. I invited Jerry to read some of the letters with me. We tried to divide them by author, so that if we did our job right, Jerry was reading exclusively for one of the teens and I was reading for the other. The only exception was the final letter, which was the only one included for that specific child. Would you go put that in your podcast? Uh-oh. What? Tell me you wasn't recording. Oops. We had just read all the letters together, and I hadn't pressed record. Do you forgive me? <sighs> sure, babe. Are we going to do it again real quick? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dear Mom, I'm very proud to have you as a mother. You're someone who really did what she could despite our position. Most parents are scared to raise one kid without a father. You raised four. I know you feel bad about that, but to us, it was growing up with a role model who, no matter what, gave us what we needed and still made time to support our crazy dreams, all the while working from nine to six. No matter what, you found happiness and always tried to be better. I'm so proud to be able to call you my mother. 
Dear Mom, I want to thank you for supporting me. Through the time I wanted to be a tattoo artist, till I wanted to be a writer, who knows, maybe next time it'll be a stripper. You never gave up on me, even through my time of indecisiveness. If you quit your job and be in real estate, I'll believe in it. Whether we live here or in another country, I'll believe in you. We're like roaches. We can survive anywhere. Do what you want to do, because life is life. Mistakes happen, but happy things happen too. Not everything is scary and mysterious. Dear Mom, I hope you're having a good day, but knowing you, you're probably really stressed out and relying on this letter for some help. Joke's on you. You suck. Just kidding. Honestly, I don't know how your mind is capable of being stressed. You always pull through. Everything you do, every mistake you've ever made, has always been for the better. God has you. As the French say, Jesus, take the wheelie. Trust in yourself, and you will always be okay. Stressing out will get you nowhere. Breathe in and out, and by the time you come home, everything will be okay. Life is too short to stress yourself into gray hair. Dear Mom, it's really hard to write uplifting letters to you when you don't really have much going for you. Just kidding, don't hurt me. Remember when I was younger and I told you that song, I'm Just a Believer, reminded me of you? Those types of people always make it through okay. When they're up high, they believe they'll stay there. When they're down low, they know they'll be up again. Please never stop being a believer. Whatever's upsetting you now, let it go. You're only feeding into it when you do that. Just believe that it's going to take you somewhere and you'll be alright. I always see you stressing and screaming over small things like lost shoes. That's no way to live. Chill out. Be happy. Dear Mom, One day you're going to be loved by someone us kids won't have a second thought about. He won't be a father to me. I'll be too old. Or to Orlando. But he will be a father to Danny and Gabe. In a way, this is sort of beautiful to me. God was like, God, this crazy lady is going to need some help. So he gave you us people you were enough for. You taught us a lot and in turn we're always going to be there for you. The rough times are over. You know what you need to know. You're going to meet him soon. Keep working on yourself and stop worrying about it because it'd be ridiculous for that man not to come along. The problem is you need to be happy with yourself before anyone healthy can be happy with you. I love you. Have a great day. Okay, last one. Dear Mama, I love you Mama. I can't even put it into words. Every time I think of a problem in the past, you or you are the one who gives me a solution, or you are the solution. For an example, when my dad passed away and you helped me. When I had problems with school, you helped me. You are the best mom when it comes to Mother's Day. Instead of going with your friend, you came with us, and that happens every time. You spend only like one hour with your friend and the rest with us. You always get what I want or need, like these binders, pencils, food, and my equipment for boxing. That's all I need. But then you got the LIK tickets, and you got a roof over our heads. And you make me a happy kid. You always have. Even when I was mad, I would wait for you. And when you would get there, you made me happy. And same for Gabe. And you work every day to get us everything, and we all love you with all of our heart. And when I was mad at God for what he did, not only to my dad, but also your stress, you helped me. Love you! Those were just a handful of the letters in that little can. If you'd like to read the rest, you can visit www.survivorsguidetohell.com to view the original pictures. Disclaimer, between our podcast and our blog, the original names on the letters have either been changed or blotted out. All right. After I'd read what these young ones had written, I was blown away with how in tune they were with their mother. I was blown away with how in tune they were with life. You have to love yourself before anyone healthy can love you? God gave you us? People you were enough for? These were both incredible lines, embedded with the amusing spelling mistakes and warm sarcasm that was oh so adolescent. At their age, I was memorizing four line poems for Mother's Day and making mom subpar breakfasts in bed. I didn't grasp the world like these kids did. Then again, I hadn't lost my father either. Being a teenager is a time of wicked uncertainty. It's lousy with mental exhaustion and unanswered questions, but it's also ripe with passion and the clarity of discovering your own philosophies before the world has tried to sink its muddy fingers into your heart. 
Maybe it's time to go back to that stage. The one where you design your own ideals before you even know what the word jaded means. So thanks, teenagers. Thanks for reminding me who you are and giving me another clue to who I am too. That is the end of today's stories. Now we invite you to join us for our weekly Silver Liners Challenge, which is designed to be an easy, actionable step you can take to help boost your week and help you survive hell. Here you go, the Silver Liners Challenge. Think about this question. What life lessons have you learned since you were a teen? Feel free to share your answers in the comments of our website, www.survivorsguidetohell.com or on our Facebook page. This is a podcast version of our sister production, A Survivor's Guide to Hell, the blog. This podcast gives you a way to access our content when you're driving, cleaning house, or prepping for Mother's Day. But if you'd like to see the videos and pictures that often accompany our posts, like original images of the mysterious Mother's Day letters, check out our website at www.survivorsguidetohell.com, where you'll also find much more information, including our storytelling code of ethics. We're always looking for cool news stories. If you have something to share, please visit our site and drop us a line. And remember, if you like this episode, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or YouTube. Listen, we're on a budget, and apparently podcasts, websites, and recording equipment are not free. Imagine that! If you'd like to help out, please visit the support portion of our site and see what you can do to contribute. Either way, thank you for contributing just by listening. Last but not least, our cheesy joke of the week. Why is a dock a bad place to raise a teenager? There's too much peer pressure. Thank you and have an excellent Monday.